everyone to the 2021 Coretta Scott King Legacy Celebration of Sisterhood and Social Justice. I'm April Wolford. I'm the VP for Advancement and Director of Alumni Relations here at Antioch College. I'm a proud Antioch alum from the class of 1992 and one of the producers of this event. And the group that you just heard was the amazing World House Choir led by... Uh... So uh, now without further ado, we'll start the program. Uh, and uh, by introducing President Emeritus Tom Manley, who will kick things off. Tom? Thank you, April. Let me add my words of welcome uh, to everyone, uh, to Antioch College and to the Credit Scott King Center Legacy Celebration, Sisterhood and Social Justice, highlighting the friendship and leadership of two remarkable women, Maya Angelou and Coretta Scott King who both have birthdays this month. As April said, I'm the President Emeritus of Antioch, Tom Manley, and I'm one of your hosts for this celebration. Let me add a very special welcome to our friends from Arkansas, the birthplace of Dr. Angelo, and many other heroes and sheroes, as she would say, of the movement for justice, including, of course, members of the Little Rock Nine, among them our keynote speaker, Minnie Jean Brown Tricky, and greetings as well to our very talented young poets. A land acknowledgement is an important path and first step to dismantling racial and colonized oppression within our spaces. Indigenous nations have always formally welcomed and acknowledged land territories when hosting visitors and when traveling to neighboring communities. Land is not just merely space that bodies occupy. It is a depository of culture, story, history, and tradition. And it is with these traditions in mind that we reflect and center ourselves and our thoughts toward respect. Please join us as we recognize and acknowledge that Ohio and the Midwest 
were built on the indigenous homelands of the good and many people of the Osage, Miamia, and the Shawnee nations, and the Adena Hopewell peoples, and many other Algonquin speaking bands. Today, the college is located on the unceded land of these people. We acknowledge these communities, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. We are committed to the process of working to dismantle ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. We acknowledge that this campus was founded upon exclusions in erasures of indigenous knowledge about how to care for these lands. We are obligated to support and educate each other with accurate information about the true history of this land. Decolonization means that we will strive to be in service of the water and the rivers and the animals in the relational solidarity with them. And as people now on this land, we must do what we can to provide nature and wildness with protection and defense. This land acknowledgement was authored by Shane Creeping Bear, Kiowa, in collaboration with Chief Ben Barnes of the Shawnee tribe based in Miami, Oklahoma, whose people were forcibly removed from Ohio areas around Wapakoneta in 1831. Other contributors include Don Knickerbocker, Anishinaabe, Jerry Neary, Dine, and support from the Greater Cincinnati Native American Coalition. I want to share briefly the Arkansas Antioch connection, as some of you may be wondering. But first, let me say that Antioch is in its 171st year as a college, and from the beginning, it has been a place working towards equity and justice in the world especially among women and people of color. Horace Mann, the great educator and Antioch's first president, famously addressed the first graduates of the school. Quote, treasure up in your hearts, these my parting words, be ashamed to die until you have won some victory for humanity. Antiochians, as we call ourselves, have taken him very seriously ever since building on that foundational value of social justice to develop a college that would emphasize applied learning through its powerful work-study program and its commitment to serve through its community as a laboratory for democracy. These values were a major reason for Coretta Scott to follow in the footsteps of her sister Edith to attend Antioch and eventually to gift the use of her name to the college many years later. Even in difficult times for small colleges, Antioch's landmark values are very much alive and well. We have framed them in three statements. Own your education, learn experientially, and act for justice. Each is practiced actively at the college and especially through the Credit Scott King Center for Intellectual and Cultural Freedom, as you will hear. And it's that practice that first drew attention from three Ar Arkansans, the last one honorary, Mark Grobmeyer, Bob Nash, the chair and vice chair of Global Solutions Institute, better known as GSI, and James Schwinn, a member of the GSI planning committee and a friend of Antioch. It was they who arranged a year and a half ago for a highly productive visit by Antioch folks to Little Rock to explore partnerships like the one bringing us together today. Thank you, Mark, Bob, and James. And now to tell you more about the Credit Scott King Center and to get the, our program in high gear, I'm pleased to introduce my colleague, Shadia Alvarez, Antioch Senior Vice President for Equity and Strategic Development and the center, uh, the center, the Credit Scott King Center's Executive Director. Shadia is a proud Antioch graduate, an educator, a community organizer, and a dedicated anti-racist fighter, and with all of that, also an amazing mother. Shadia? Thank you, Tom. I truly appreciate your words. And I want to acknowledge that the First Nations are here with us today as well. So we open this opportunity, this collective conversation, this collegial uh, community of folks, uh, knowing that we have the affirmation 
um, and the love of the people that now are not just studying uh, movements, but are actually day-to-day -day working in them. So thank you for being here. Uh, we are excited to be in relationship with you and sharing this moment. I wanted to share a few words to give you some context for how we got here today. As many of you know, COVID upended our lives and left us all reeling. Grief, sadness, anger, and loss in an unshakable reality that the healthcare outcomes of our nation were based on zip code and race. We couldn't look away. Those of us working on the front lines were not surprised. We saw the daily practice and the loss in all of the institutions where black and brown and first nation folks journey. And yet the catastrophe of COVID was overwhelming and the local mutual aid and organizing networks could not match the urgency with which the virus spread and the negligence of the agents that were asked to be in our care, but yet looked away. And so we all collectively retreated into our homes, into our small pods of community. Then we desperately thought we can get through COVID and the death of George Floyd came. And it marked not just a reawakening, but it brought folks into a collective conscious. And so the death of George Floyd marked a collective breakdown and at the same time pushed others from the sidelines into the center. For some, the questions were, do I see? Do I accept? Do I do something? And so folks did. They marched, we met, they strategized with local, national, and global contexts. There were conversations around the world about what do we do now? And people tried desperately to reclaim what little humanity they lost when they heard George echo for his mom. And so through song, through healing circles, through collective action, conversations began anew and a movement long considered not relevant was ignited. There were generations of us that were told that the civil rights movement was something of the past. It already happened. That conversation shifted. And so today we find ourselves at the Coretta Scott King Center in the midst of this context, renewing our commitment to facilitate learning and dialogue on issues of racial justice, social justice, and human rights. We also feel called to action, to being a place that opens doors instead of closes them, a place where we are a contribution to the movement, not necessarily the movement, we feel moved to amplify the voices of movement builders and organizing collectives that are leading the way to creating a more justice and equitable society. And we see ourselves at the Coretta Scott King Center as a local hub for the work that's already going on and that we ourselves need to learn more about. And so while we see a lot of work being done in criminal justice, housing, education, social services, and healthcare, we also feel very committed to making sure that that work is shared and that we learn from it and are in community with the actions that need to be taken in order for institutions to become racially just and socially, socially equitable. We see ourselves building upon voting rights and our annual boot camp for activism. And we see ourselves being both humble and in service of what's already been done. We see ourselves as a partner and a confidant and a truth seeker. And we see ourselves as more than just a center, but a true vibrant hub of connection. And so we hope that you join us in that. We hope that you become a witness, an advocate, a partner. We hope that you hold us accountable to that vision and that in the many conversations that we hope to have, that you stay committed to following what Coretta and Maya taught us, which is you cannot fight for something without vision. And this road, whether it's a struggle or revolution, depending on the generation that you ask, is always merged with different ideas. And yet the commitment has to be to working through it together. 
And so today, you will hear some powerful voices that will be leading us to think about what that could look like. Uh, the next person that I'm going to introduce is a testament uh, to what I've shared with you. Um, I met Janice last summer, Janice Kearney, and what struck me about her was her ease and her ability to capture big ideas and put them right and say, no, this is the way we can go. And I was like, I want to hang out with her. So Janice is the 14th of 19 children born into a sharecropping family in the Delta region of Southeastern Arkansas. Janice is a writer, a publisher, a journalist, and an instructor. She was inducted into the Arkansas Writers Hall of Fame in 2016 and penned several books and founded a publishing company called Writing Our World Publishing, which offered writing out loud, creating powerful oral histories as a workshop for new and emerging writers. Janice fell in love with the sound and feel of words as a child in the Southeast Delta. She creates stories about her and Southerners' lives through short stories, memoir, biography, and fiction. She served as a publisher for the Arkansas State Press, founded by civil rights legend Daisy Gates and Bates. And she served eight years in the Clinton presidency as a White House media affairs specialist and then the director of public communications for the U.S. Small Business Administration. She also served for the last five years of Clinton's presidency as a personal diarist to President Clinton. And in 2004, she published Cotton Field of Dreams, a memoir of her childhood and her journey into the Oval Office. And so without further ado, I will tell you that her passion is obviously writing, but it's also this project that has brought us together, the Celebrate Maya project. And so Janice, I pass it to you so you can share all these wonderful things that I've been able to learn from you. Good morning, and thank you, Shadia, for that very kind introduction. Uh, and also, I want to thank Tom, because Tom, you and I, I think, talked earlier on about the possibility of a partnership. And I'm just so grateful today that that conversation took place. I'm so proud of all you all are doing at the center at the Coretta Scott King Center. And I think there is no more important time than now to continue your great and important work. What a wonderful day, Shadia and Tom, for all of us as we celebrate the birthdays of these two amazing women, Coretta Scott King and Maya Angelou, who centered their lives and their work around ensuring social justice for all. Could there be a better moment in time to highlight their invaluable contributions to our world? This day is important for a number of reasons. Every day that we speak the words social justice in this country, every day that we talk about making social justice a reality, every day that we commit to working to create a community and a culture that celebrates social justice, equity, and diversity is a good day for all of us. Mm. And most importantly, for our future. And we, the Celebrate Maya Project, are so proud to be a part of this commitment, this initiative, and we are happy to play our part, whatever that turns out to be. So let me tell you a little bit about the Celebrate Maya project. Uh, we are a 501c3 nonprofit. We were founded in 2014 by a group of women who wanted to celebrate Maya's life and her contributions in the state of Arkansas. Most people don't know that she spent a number of years during her childhood in a small town called Stamps, Arkansas. She arrived in Arkansas at eight years old, silent and bruised by life. But thanks to that amazing village who nurtured her soul, her spirit, she left at 14 with an unforgettable voice and she was well on her way to becoming the phenomenal Maya Angelou we now all revere. 
The Celebrate Maya project was created to ensure that the state of Arkansas joined the rest of the world in paying recognition and homage to this amazing woman. And we did that. But after the celebration and the day of remembrance, we realized that Maya Angelou would want more from us than an annual celebration. We believed she would want us to find a way to impact lives throughout the year, especially the lives of young people. And six years later, that is the genesis of who we are and what we do. Our mission is to serve youth through Arkansas, throughout Arkansas with specific focus on the Arkansas Delta, where our children are the most in need. It is so important that we create a village wherever we go, working with schools, parents, community leaders, and the youth. We create literacy, literacy curriculums. We hold writing and history workshops, art and poetry workshops and contests, and intergenerational public forums. We award four academic scholarships each year and four emerging poet awards. We like to say that our overall goal is to help grow dreams in the Arkansas Delta by helping youth discover their voices and giving them the confidence to lift their voices. We are proud that we have served over 1,000 students around the state and we're partnering with schools, communities, and nonprofit organizations throughout Arkansas. So we have a lot of work to do, especially after COVID-19, not just with the children, but with communities. And we're rolling up our sleeves right now to prepare that. So I wanna say again, thank you, Antioch, for this wonderful opportunity to share our story, but also to partner with you on such an important initiative. So before I go, I'd like to introduce someone Adele Holmes is my friend and colleague. She serves with me on the planning team for this event, and she's a very active member of the Celebrate Maya Project's executive board. She's a philanthropist with a special passion for social justice, including her recent underwriting of a fellowship for young writers on social justice. She's also a pediatrician who was in private practice for 20 years before that was interrupted by her unquenchable desire to wander the world and give back to the community in an effort to help to make the world a better place. Adele is also a Stephen minister at Second Presbyterian Church in Little Rock. She and her husband, Chris, frequently donate time and funds to charities, especially those involving young people. As if her life wasn't full enough, since 2016, Adele has entrenched herself in the world of writing. So in 2022, her first novel will be published. I present to you one of our own phenomenal women, Adele Holmes. Thank you, Janice. Well, has anyone noticed that young poets are having a moment right now? Next, you're going to hear from two of the best young poets you'll ever hear. A sister and a brother, Jamie McAdoo and Norel McAdoo. These two are both graduates of Little Rock Central High. Jamie is a sophomore at Jackson State University, majoring in journalism and media studies. She is a professional spoken word poet, an award-winning playwright, a former on-air radio personality, a published author, and the first and forever Miss 2019 Heritage Outstanding Teen. At Jackson State, she is the SGA representative for the MADRA performance troupe. MADRA stands for Making a Difference, Doing Respectful, Respectable, and Meaningful Art. She is an active member of the Outspoken Arts Collective and the current president of Jackson State's chapter of the National Society of Collegiate Scholars. Norell is a 21-year-old senior civil engineering major at Tennessee State University in Nashville. He produces music projects, writes poetry, 
and participates in social justice activities in and around the state of Arkansas and throughout the nation. Norell is a renowned award-winning poet and he was commissioned to perform and facilitate workshops during the 60th commemoration of the desegregation of Little Rock Central High School. Phew, wow. Are you ready for these two? Take it away, McAdoos. All right, my name is Norell. And I'm Jamie. Thank you for that great introduction. Um, we have a few poems for you all today, so hang in there with us. We're used to live performances, but we can still feel the love and support from this audience today. Yeah, you can you can do a, a reaction. If you hear something that you like, you can do a thumbs up or a clapping reaction, and we'll see that, and we'll know that y'all are sending love. And I'll start this off with the first poem, and I entitled this poem, um, Woke Up One Morning. I woke up one morning. My heart heavy. See, I don't trust like I used to. I realized that that's deadly. I became more realistic. I gave up on optimism. Cops to blacks are ops to hit them. See, these blocks are prisons. They got us looking through prisms. We're blind to the system. Hidden to the way that we should be living. It's a lot of ignorance. No wonder why they ain't fearing us. They think we're illiterates. They're fighting us like militants. They still got us in chains. We can't seem to snatch the one that's on our brains that continues to remain. I got a question. Is half freedom really better than none? Because it's kind of like we're finally getting a plate, but the food's undone. We're being told that we're family, but being treated like a stepson. Content with the progress. Some people say we gained a ton, but I don't celebrate victories that haven't come. This war is far from won. Look, let me tell you why I think this way. Back to the other day, I noticed they got us brainwashed. They got us working chain jobs like cooks and the janitors. Not many of us scholars and professors. It's like the white man's playing chess and we're stuck on playing checkers. They got us in check just when we thought they was going to have to king us later. And even when we get a king, they gun them down. And when we make a stride, they make sure it don't happen again. Obama gets in the house, but why you think they made Trump win is backlash and backhanded compliments. Even success has consequence. We integrate schools for learning. Whites leave and give us the financial burden, even though they're still in charge, so by and large, it loses funding. Fundamental resources become less abundant until we have close to nothing. That's only one something. One example, every aspect of the system is corrupt. I can only take so many punches to the gut until my core erupts. I'm so full of distrust. Intrapersonal warfare got my heart feeling crushed, making it harder for me to love. I get thoughts that make even peace tough. All I want is my people up, no matter what it takes. Change is slow. That's unacceptable. We need to speed up the pace. Free all my people. This is getting too heavy. I can no longer bear the weight. Lord, take it away. Ooh. Thank you. That's a 10 for me. If we were at a poetry <laughs> slam, I would give them a 10 out of 10. Okay, moving right along. So the theme is social, social justice. Where do we go from here? So this is a poem that I wrote entitled Report Cards In. According to most grading scales, a 90% and above is an A. 80 to 89 is a B grade. 70 to 79 is a C. 60 to 69 is a D. And if you earn a 59% or less, then you've earned yourself an F. And F stands for failing, not mm -hmm. accurately getting the work done, not actually following the instructions. To fail means you did not learn what you needed to. Maybe you didn't go about practicing the right way. Maybe you didn't study enough every day. Or maybe you didn't care to pass and thought, I don't need this anyway. I wonder what's the case with the world today? Did we not accurately get the work done in areas that needed to be worked on? Did we not actually follow God's instructions because we failed? Maybe we didn't go about practicing love and highlighting morals in a way that would stick. Maybe we didn't force those who are so close-minded to just try it, try accepting those who are different and loving those who are not kindred. Maybe we didn't encourage enough people to study the world and its truth, no matter how many lessons it takes to read and to listen and to pay attention until there's good enough comprehension to study and to study like it is your mission to pass because it should be. Life is one big exam. To study other cultures and see the beauty in all parts of the Venn diagram. To be mindful of past events and to trust history, but not history books, to challenge norms. See, studying is a big part of getting a good grade. Maybe we just wanted an easy A. Thought God would pass us if we just put it all in his name. One nation, under God. Thought we could get an A plus by not even doing much, but following the same flashcards of evil that have been going on since way before today's group of people, maybe we've become too complacent with our F because every class before us has left 
uncontrollable chaos, an undeniable divide, and more failing systems than I can get out in one breath without losing the rhythm, but man, have we failed. No more study sessions filled with more subjective games that aim to favor the behaviors of the privileged whites, because the majority of the minorities who are the majority of the nation don't just lose games, they lose real lives. There are some good people out there, but that doesn't mean we can just round up. We keep on failing. And what do you do when you fail a course? You just have to repeat. You just have to reteach until mastery is reached. Maybe this generation is the class that will study enough. Maybe this generation is the class that will practice enough. Maybe this generation is the class that will learn and teach and maybe will pass or at least bring us up to a D. But we all have homework to do. So I have my notes that I've been jotting and we got some ideas that we've been plotting and we're ready to work. Mm. Yeah, that was powerful, Jay. And um, and so both of us, we're, we're members of the Righteous Collective that's here in Central Arkansas and it's open to all youth poets, uh, youth artists, youth activists, any type of art form that, that you create, we accept you here at Righteous. And um, so both of these poems that we just presented, we, 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 we've done with Righteous at various events and um, different things. And also we've been in collaboration with the Celebrate Maya Project for years now. So I do want to thank Ms. Janice Kearney for inviting us for this momentous occasion. And we're happy to celebrate the work of the past, but also look forward to the future and where we can be in that future. So we only have one more poem for you all today. This is a duo poem. All of these poems are original. And like you said, we're a part of The Righteous, which you can find. And I also have my website, jamiemcadoo.com, if you want more content. Right. And you can find The Righteous on, on Instagram or Facebook. On Instagram is the righteous yes and that's righteous w-r-i-t-e-o-u-s but we'll put it in the chat we don't want to take up too much time we'll finish off with this last poem that was a black history poem success seemed to shape shift into into obstacles. obstacles every time we nearly make a breakthrough say goodbye to all the good things that we were able to relate to and hello to more stereotypes that make people hate you as As another another wall wall is built with intentions intentions to break you let me ask you Are we progressing? Are we progressing? Because at this point, I can't tell the difference between advancing and retreating. We We talk talk about about change, change, but are we believing? We We talk talk about about change, so are we ML kinging? We We talk talk about about change, but but are we we only dreaming? dreaming? See, I wish that I could tell you. If we all come together, it'll happen. Just spread a little love, that's all that we're lacking, but continuing bad behavior in this country is like a bad habit. A lot of people neglect the fact that we even have it. People say racism doesn't exist. But racism is a disease. We need to discover the cure or create some sort of vaccine. I'm tired of begging and pleading for racism to stop beating and beating. I just hope in the near future, this cycle stops repeating. 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 What does the future look like for Blacks? I just hope it doesn't resemble our past. See, they've controlled our views so that we can't see all all the the red red flags. flags. But in the future, the future is in our hands. Will you just let it slip out of your grasp? In the future, we, everybody in here is determining what is going to be. But if some of us don't fall too far from our tree, then we're just continuing cycles we got from our parents' seeds. We We can't can't predict predict the future, future, but we we can can plant our seeds seeds better. better. To To make make such changes happen, we have to come together. Not Not just talking, talking, not just dreaming, dreaming, but working on the future we plan on achieving. That That means means actively actively doing actions and actually believing believing in the power of believing. The The future future is approaching. approaching. Thank you all. Thank you so much. And we're excited to watch the rest of the program. Those two young people are just amazing. We love them so much here in Arkansas. (laughs) So my very, very wonderful duty right now is to introduce someone that I have loved and been in awe of for as long as I've known her. So I'm going to introduce Minnie Jean Brown Tricky. I don't think she needs an introduction, but I I have to do it. Minnie Jean Brown Tricky has lifelong experience and commitment to peacemaking, environmental issues, developing youth leadership, diversity education and training, cross-cultural communication, gender and social justice advocacy. 
Minnie Jean is one of the nine African-American students who collectively resisted opposition to the desegregation to enter Little Rock Central High School in 1957 with protection from federal troops. Minnie Jean's teaching experience in social work includes Carleton University and community colleges in Canada. She served in the Clinton administration as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Workforce Diversity at the Department of Interior. She was the Shipley visiting writer for her to studies at Arkansas State University. And for the past 20 years, she has been a nonviolence and anti-racism facilitator for Sojourn to the Past, a 10-day interactive history experience for high school students. She continues as a teacher, writer, and motivational speaker. She's the mother of three sons and three daughters. Mrs. Brown Tricky is the recipient of numerous awards for her community work for social justice, including a lifetime achievement tribute by the Canadian Race Relations Foundation and the International Wolf Award for contributions to racial harmony. With the Little Rock Nine, she received the NAACP Spingarn Medal and the Congressional Gold Medal. She's the member of the Little Rock Nine Foundation that awards nine scholarships biannually. She holds a Bachelor of Science work in Native Human Services from Laurentian University and Master of Social Work from Carleton University in Ontario. She is the recipient of four honorary doctorates. She's the subject of a documentary, Journey to Little Rock, The Untold Story of Minnie Jean Brown Tricky, which received critical acclaim in international films, film festivals in Africa, England, Ireland, North Ireland, the US, South America, and Canada. Ms. Brown Tricky has been featured in People Magazine, Newsweek, The Ottawa Citizen, BBC, The Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, Donahue, CNN, The History Channel's Turning Point in History, HBO Documentary, Little Rock Central, 50 Years Later, and so many other television and radio shows. She also appeared with the Little Rock Nine on Oprah. In 2016, Minnie Jean Brown Tricky donated more than 20 personal objects to the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. The collection includes a Little Rock Central High School yearbook, a graduation dress, a personal letter from President Dwight D. Eisenhower, a notice of suspension, and photographs. She is a proud mother and grandmother who still travels globally, spreading a message of anti-racism, nonviolence, peace, and reconciliation. It gives me great pleasure to present to you Minnie Jean Brown Tricky. Thank you, Janice. Um, oh my goodness, what a wonderful, special treat it is for me to join you today. Uh, first, I will uh, tell you that I'm speaking from the unceded uh, traditional lands of the Musqueam, Tusaluth, Squamish, and Coast Salish people. Wow, this is a wonderful moment. I'm so honored to be a part of this program, which, you know, it models exactly my sort of belief system, which is a collaboration, partnership, working together. And Although most of the stories I hear from Arkansas are about your Senator Tom Cotton, I'm, a, I'm happy to know that there are, people are doing good work there. And I want to thank you, Janice, who I have loved and admired over time. And I will say that she is directly responsible for my work in the Clinton administration. So we've been hanging out for a while and we are true homies in the whole process. Um, and thank you to the McAdoo young people. I actually, um, I have to admit, I prefer to hang out with young people because they keep me excited, they energize me, they inspire me. So. This is fitting very well in the sort of way that I feel and think. 
So part of, you know, I'm sort of expected to talk about Little Rock because that's the thing that I had participated in when I was 16. Uh, often we don't have to talk about something that happened so far back in the last century, uh, uh, practically the Middle Ages when we're thinking about it, but based on what those young people say and said and believe and think and challenge us to think, they don't see it as much different. So that's the kind of thought that we have to be really honest about that that was 60 plus years ago, but in, in the United States, I consider the highest value. There are two high values in the United States. One is violence and the other one is segregation. And it's done so well and so effectively that it has lasted. So I can talk about um, the desegregation process in a way that I've sort of tried to frame it and it's about choices and how we as individuals and groups make choices. So I start, of course, with um, who had the power in 1957? Uh, governor, the Southern Manifesto, the Congress. Uh, so to uh, the Congress, congressional members formed to oppose desegregation. So if we think that was then and this is now, I think we can, we're, I'm constantly seeing similarities. Um, so with that opposition, with, we are looking at the power, the people who had the power. On the day of my uh, signing up to go to Central, my homeroom teacher said, if you live in the Central District and you're interested, please sign up. And I skipped home and said to my mother, oh, I signed up to go to Central. And she said exactly what all mothers say. Okay, we'll see. And then of course, the rest is history. But in the meantime, there were um, rallies, segregationists, rallies, and I, I was really fascinated how it kept being mixed with religion. And the White Mothers League who were demonstrating at the Capitol, all their signs had God in it and sin. And that was really weird, but I didn't pay very much attention. I have to admit that at 15, living in the Jim Crow South, I was very protected, I was persuaded by everyone I knew, my family, my teachers, my church, that I was smart, talented, and I thought I was beautiful. Okay, so we'll start right there. So we have the power, and they've been persuading people to object, to resist desegregation. So on September 3rd, I think, um, sort of try to understand what the governor Fabus meant when he said units of the National Guard are surrounding the school. And because I didn't really know the coded language, he said, if integration happens, blood will run in the streets. So I'm 15, oh well, that means, I don't know, I'll just go see. And so a group of us, my mother drove me to a block away from the school and my minister, two white ministers and two black ministers said, we're going with you. So they walked to the half block and we, we were sandwiched between a screaming mob. It sounded like an American religious ceremony, football game, only the sound was vicious and hatred and, and people were screaming, kill them and go, the, you know, the American phrases that we use all the time, go back to where you came from, uh, we'll kill you, uh, hang them, all those cool phrases that we 
like to use. That's part of the American vocabulary and discourse. And I'm looking at these people. And of course, the pictures I see of the Little Rock, not, we're standing there and I say, we threw away, they threw away their dignity and it landed on us because their mouths were open, screaming, but something else happened that I saw them. And I said, in my life, I will never be told what to do by some demagogue. And I, I will never be violent. And I will never lose my mind. And so the way I think about them, even now, is people who were locked in hate and couldn't hear or couldn't feel or couldn't understand, nor could they see us as kids. And so that's my thought. So we had that. So we went home, not really knowing what to do, but uh, the local NAACP, Ms. Daisy and Elsie Bates, our lawyer was there with Marshall and the whole Legal Defense Fund came to Little Rock to challenge all the injunctions that were being made by everybody. And a federal judge ruled that desegregation should continue. And so we went back on the 23rd after all the court things. And President Eisenhower had persuaded Governor Favis to remove the National Guard. So we were protected by the Little Rock Police and the Arkansas State Police. So we got crept in through a side door, um, got met by a few students who are part of the presidents of the different organizations. And then we went to our classes. And about 20 minutes after we got in, Somebody came and said, you've got to go to the office. We went to the office and they said, we have to take you out. You have to leave. And I was really disappointed. I wasn't sure. I could hear the roar. And they, uh, Central has a, a lower, base, uh, lower basement with a garage or something. And they put us in two police cars. And they said, put your heads down. And they told the drivers, once you start, do not stop. And they peeled out and took us somewhere where I can't remember. So, I mean, all these things sort of relate to today. So when people say, this is not us, this has never happened before, I can tell you it did, and it is us. So there's where we go, we, we, we start with that, this is us. This is what we do. This is how we do it. These are the ways we do it. And so these children, those children who were there are telling us how they see it. And we, we really must listen. Actually, I can go to the highest level university in the world, and I asked people, could you just be in the fifth grade while I'm talking? Because I want to talk to a sort of clean slate. I want to talk to you before you get jaded. So I'm a, I'm a great proponent of children. So obviously the final thing was President Eisenhower saw people being beaten, these images went all around the world and he acted for whatever reason I cannot say and sent the 101st. So that's a good, good enough um, start. But when we're talking about choices that people make, so we have the power who incites the opposition. We have the supporters in AACP, the Bateses, our communities, the world, 
because we got letters from all over the world. And my favorite thing to show my kids is the letter that had Mini Jean USA and it got to my house. So we, you know, we have to understand that at, at a certain point, these, ish, these things become worldwide and the world is watching. And inside the school you have, so everybody says, were there any nice kids? Yes, 20 kids decided to be nice. That means they smiled. Uh, Robin Brown shared a book, got beaten up for that. We appreciated them and said, don't talk to us in school because we don't want to see you get beaten up. Uh, you had mm, 200 mean kids. I call it American terrorism at its finest, who did unbelievable things every day. And it doesn't matter what you call them. I think um, my daughter worked at the Little Rock Central High School National Historic Site. And people told her things. So she knows more than I do because people came in and they ratted on each other. They never admitted anything. But they said, I saw. So I think one of the most interesting things is this Arkansas National Guardsman who was terminal, had a terminal illness. And he admitted that he had stopped five girls from putting my head in the toilet. So if we think, you know, this thing is about black and white, it's about humanity and it's about all of us and it's the whole idea that we are responsible for each other, that we are interrelated, interconnected, and interdependent. So we have, we have, that's how I think. So we have the mean kids, we have the nice kids, but we had 1,800 kids who stood by and said nothing. And so Ellie Wiesel, who's a Holocaust survivor, says, quote, we must take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a Holocaust victim, he died as a victim. His statement is, not to act is to act. Not to speak is to speak. And I love that expression. So we had all these kids who stood by and said nothing. So when I'm working in anti-bullying um, situations, I say, don't bother the mean kid. Say something to the kid who's getting hurt because bullying is crazy making. I, am, I understand that very well. Even with the kind of terror that I was receiving at Central, the way the girl's vice principal would respond was, Manny Jane, what did you do now? And I'll tell you what I did. I was tall, beautiful, and proud. And they believed that I was inferior and I didn't have an inferior bone in my body. So, that's, you know, that drives people crazy. So we got those choices. And I consider persist persistence choice to be one of Little Rock Nine was pretty cool. And when they scared us on the first day, it was really possible that we had gone under our beds and stayed there, frightened away. But we went back. And what I tell young people is you can make presidents act. Kids in Birmingham made presidents act. Little Rock Nine made presidents act. You too can make presidents act. So I'm cool about that. Um, now that I'm older, I have a depth of analysis that has really helped me. And I admire those kids from deep in my heart because they 
didn't know what they were up against. They didn't. And they did it anyway. So, hey, kids, they don't tell you this story in American history. They give, you, give it a paragraph because they don't want you to know what you're capable of. So you people who are working with young people and you young people, you prove that you're more capable than anybody gives you credit for. So that's my thing. I really work with young people and say, and I've seen results of some of my actions with young people. Okay, so one of the things, so that's the kind of story. But one of the things that happens is people will come up to me and say, I have a PhD. Bravo, cool. But I didn't know this. I'm not going to tolerate that anymore, okay? We have more access to information than we've ever had. Ever, ever, ever. And I'll say, I'll give you my 20 book list. You choose four books. And when you're finished reading them, you come back and then I'll talk to you. I can't talk to people who have chosen hashtag profound intentional ignorance. I can't help you if you don't know anything. So don't ever come up to me and say, I have a PhD because I'm going to trash you if you say you didn't know. I'm friends with Lisa, Lisa McNair, who is the sister of one of the four little girls in the bombing in 1963. And people, white people in Birmingham, say they didn't know. And yet Birmingham has the, the title of Bombingham. So you can't play that with me anymore. I was asked uh, by young people yesterday, a group of kids who are do nonviolence and teach it and live it. They say, how do I talk, talk to my friends who disagree with me? I said, you know what? I think just model. Don't try to change anybody's mind. Just do what you do. Don't get mad, get even. Don't get mad, get smart. Turn pain into power and just walk through the chaos. Um, young people ask me, how do I survive racism? Well, maybe you do survive and maybe you don't. But Gloria, these are two girls, Gloria and Carlotta walked through the madness and were on the honor roll. I'm gonna tell you, I can't say enough that that's not your problem, that's it's their problem. So if your friends don't dis if your friends don't agree with you, you have to decide: Do you need friends like that? And so we must, at all times, be willing to have conversation if someone wants to have conversation. But when I talk about being locked, that I saw in the mob and that I've seen in the behavior of people, I'm not sure if I can reach them. And I would rather spend my energy helping young people to see their potential and to believe in their capabilities. And I, you know, thank goodness, when I talk about activism, one of the things I guess I want young people to know is I'm sorry. I didn't do enough. I see social justice activism as a life sentence and I've done as much and I'll continue to do. But I still am sorry that I didn't do enough. And I just wanna say that I see I think when uh, Janice was reading my bio, I tried to include everything because all of this is related. I'm a convicted environmentalist. I've been to jail for that. I've been to jail for sitting in. I think it's all related and we have to see 
the relationship. One of the things I want to say to young people is, in the United States, uh, you kind of like to look at other people and say, over there, they do this, and over there, they do that. I'm proposing a mirror, okay? Because here, we do it all. And I was watching an interview with Hillary Clinton and Katie Couric, and they were talking about backlash uh, for about for women. But I want to talk about backlash for uh, social justice. And, um, and I'm going to, and I do recommend, if you don't know, I mean, I think some of the books I read should be core curriculum. One of the problems I have with middle school and, and high school is they keep reading To Kill a Mockingbird. And I'm saying, oh, goodness sakes, can't you get anything new? Do we need any more white saviors who don't like the people who they're saving and who, anyway. So uh, Karen Anderson has a number of books and she's my hero. Uh, her, one of her books is White Rage, uh, The Unspoken Truth of Our Racial Divide. And I feel the resistance to social change at every level. So I don't envy the work that these young people have to do. I cannot advise young people to go into the streets because of the laws that are being made to hurt them, to kill them. What are we talking about? What? If we're super sympathetic about what happens someplace else, but we've watched ourselves become this. So I can't advise for that, but I do say, keep on writing your poems, keep on doing your spoken word, do the music, do the art, do the building coalitions, work across cultures, don't let these people divide you, because that's the game. So pay attention to how the strategies continue to backlash on social justice. And one of the things I say about the central high crisis is, yes, the Black kids were terrorized and brutalized, but that situation hurt all the children, okay? And I say to parents and people who care, if you keep doing this high value of segregation across class, culture, language, color, you're hurting all the kids. You're not doing the best for your children. When you, you know, the largest, the most segregated group are white kids, but we don't talk about it like that. And when I talk to people who say, I have a PhD, they're in a bubble of ignorance. And we just got to undo that. So I raised my kids. Um, my niece came to Ottawa, Canada on Canada Day. And there are all these young people sitting around. She said, Aunt Nanny, your house looks like the UN. I said, that's how I want it. I will not be limited to interacting with one group. I don't care what it is or who it is. So these are the kinds of things I think we have to really encourage in our children because this sort of segregated life we live has been imposed on us. Uh, so also Karen Anderson wrote One Person, No Vote, which turns out to be predictive. So Heather McGee, my book list just keeps raising, and because I've been quarantined for a, for a year, I'm suffering from too much information, which is cool. But I wish my kids say, we wish you could give us stuff through osmosis. I, I wish I could, too. So, of course, you can read Robin D'Angelo, white woman who talks about racism. My... my uh, I love Jane Elliott. 
and you have to check her out. She's the woman who did the brown eyes, blue eyes uh, experiment many years ago in Iowa. But it's it's actually telling and it's actually appropriate for 2021. And then Heather McGee, that's the latest one, The Sum of Us, What Racism Costs Everyone and How We Can Prosper. So Heather, girl, mm-hmm, go. Uh, cast by Isabel Wilkerson. Cast, The Origins of Our Discontent. And, woo Exterminate All the Brutes, which is a row, it's on HBO, and it looks at the source of white supremacy. So what is, what is what, what am I hopeful about? Our children, who know more than we do and can teach us. So I'm going to tell a little story. I've been going to this school in Nashville for 16 years for the fifth grade. That's why I like fifth grade. And so it was just for the kids over, you know, I mean, those, and they use Little Rock as the full core curriculum for a year because it covers everything, government, liter Melba's book, every possible way. Um, and the parents were upset because their kids knew more than they did. So they asked for a parents meeting. So in part now, I do the young people and then I have to do one for the parents. So there's my proof that kids teach their parents and we need to pay attention. Um, I don't know about the time, but one of the, you know, of course we have the Gandhi expression, be the change you wish to see in the world. But the one that I really like for the reason that we don't know what's coming and we don't know actually how to fix things. Uh, we do the best we can, young people. But there is a Spanish poet, Antonio Machado. Wayfarer, there is no road. Your footsteps are the road and nothing else. We make the road by walking. By walking, we make the road. I can't see it being stated any better. Okay, one well, another book that I really, uh, part of our things that we need to know is the book called A Color of Law, History of How Our Government Segregated America. And it's by Richard Rothstein. Because when people say, well, I live in a very white neighborhood, and I will say, do you know why? And if you don't know why, so what people say, we like to be with our own kind. Which kind is that? What are we talking about? So we have all these. So one of the things that Raul um, Peck does in his um, document, uh, documentary, Exterminate All the Brutes, in a New York um, New Yorker review that I read, it said, this is a story that needed to be told. But one of the things that he proposes is that in the West, we look at the Holocaust, of course, over there, so that we don't have to look at our own, the world Holocaust and the Holocaust that we participate in in our place where we are. Uh, and I think that's kind of interesting. So that's something I think that uh, an academic institution might start to think about is, I, I was uh, asked to do um, a commemorate, uh, be in a commemoration with Malala when she got the constitutional 
award j just about the same time that she got the Nobel Prize. Um, and it turned out that Malala and I had exactly the same experience. She got shot. I was going to be shot because after I was expelled uh, about 20 years later, when the girl's vice principal, uh, her book was being made into a movie. And you can't have a Little Rock story without Minnie Jean because Minnie Jean dropped chili on two boys and got suspended. And then she got expelled because five girls brutalized her and she turned and used two words. Um, but so she, she wanted me to be in the movie. And I said I didn't want to um, because I was horrified by getting expelled and I felt I was punished. And she said, but Minnie Jean, they were going to kill you. But she didn't tell my parents that. And she didn't tell me that. And that's ultimate racism, in my opinion, right? That she had that knowledge and did not share it. So I I'm glad I wasn't Malala and got, got shot in the head. But it was the same story. It's about education. But we love Malala. And I've seen Greta as well the young environmentalists. But we have indigenous kids, we have black kids, we have kids talking about the same thing that are interested in social justice, in uh, global warming and all that. And I, I don't know who they are. Because we like to look there and not here. So those are kinds of things, yeah. Thank you, Minnie Jean, so very much. We are going to let okay. you off the hook. We could listen to you all day long. Thank you so much. Okay, I was hoping for that hook. Yes, right. <laughs> I think I really we are it. going to uh, take a few questions. April? Oh, cool. Okay. So, Minnie Jean, one of the questions that was put in the chat, which you addressed um, in part, uh, was around family and what types of values uh, should uh, families be thinking about to, to raise the type of courageous children that you described? <coughs> well, first of all, we have to state that a family consists of whoever takes care of you. And... I think for my own family, my dad had a sixth grade education, but every night it was, you got to get an education, you got to get an education, every night, and we hated that whole conversation. Uh, but we had to hear it. And um, my mom kind of said, you know, you're going to escape this and that sort of Arkansas Jim Crow thing, right? And people shouldn't have to escape. That, that's one of the things. People should be able to live where they want to uh, in peace. But my whole, my church, that's where all the social activities happened. Uh, what colored why? The, I went to the library every Saturday and the librarian had She'd have a nice little stack of books, said, you might like this. And yeah, I was reading stuff. I was reading Hemingway and all that way before I understood it. And now I'm, I'm having to read it again. But so consequently, because she usually had six books stacked on a table for me to look at, I have six books on my night table at all times. I don't know. That was, I didn't, you know, I kind of noticed that later in life. And so there were forms of resistance that we saw in our families. For instance, uh, my two best friends were Melba Patillo and Thelma Mothershed, and we were of the Little Rock Nine as well. And 
our parents made our clothes because, so my sister who may be on this thought or sort of considered it was, they were being cheap, but no, they did it because they were resisting the, you could maybe try on clothes, but it wasn't, nobody really wanted you to. And so they made our clothes and most of the parents I knew so we were witnesses to different kinds of resistances that were happening, right, at all, all the time. Uh, my, my church, my, my brother ran away to California and was in Oakland at the time of the Black Panthers. He came back to Little Rock. There was no place for him to meet. So he met, well... My mom's church or our church first said, well, we don't want, because there are all kinds of young people that you organize. We're not sure if we want those kids in our church. And the minister was one of the Cone brothers. And he said, if we don't, if they can't meet in our church, we're failing our young people. So people are forced to make decisions. So we're in a nice comfortable bubble that so I never had an individual act of racism mm -hmm. against me as a as a kid well maybe a bus driver or two mm -hmm. but it was the institutional power that was dominating the Jim Crow life so it's kind of like you don't pay attention to them you pay attention to you and your own personhood, right? You can't waste your time paying attention to them. And my mama said, they're just ignorant, okay. I mean, and that maybe is what she knew or what she thought. But she said, don't waste your time, hmm. you can't. And that I think is, is probably good advice that you do your activism, you write your poetry, you do your work, you encourage your children, you try to scare the hell out of them. Maybe you don't even let them drive. Um, what, what happens when I think about today's situation in 57, 58, our car, our family car was a target for whoever wanted to do whatever. And so my uncle, loaned me his car so I could drive around and be mm. safe. Uh, so people can do all kinds of things for That's you. Right. Um, That's right. You know, the Bateses organized the media and she knew how to do that. So even though we were the colored kids from Little Rock, Arkansas, we stepped up and represented ourselves well. So yes, yes, here's the deal. Whatever we need, that's what I say to kids. They say, oh, you're so courage, courageous. So I, I don't even know what courage means. I just know that when the time came for me to walk through that terror, whatever it was, was there yeah. when, in my life when we were um, asked, Jim Lawson, who's a nonviolence guru, asked us, when, you, when do you think I came there to teach you? And we said, well, you must have come in October. He said, no, I came in February. And when I got there, you'd already, you already knew the things to do to survive in a situation using nonviolence. So boom, that's the lesson I give. It's already there. You just have to listen, pay attention to it. So um, that's, yeah, I, I mean, my son actually was beaten by the police. Uh, and he had to go to court and he won it because we played every guerrilla theater thing you could. And so these are the kinds of things we can help young people with. Don't go to court alone. Take, 
get people off the streets, fill up the courtroom and have them all looking, you know, this like it, activism is just be open. Okay, so I have a daughter who was in a car accident and she, a right leg amputee, she uses a wheelchair. So now I'm just, boom, don't, I'm a disability activist. I'm an anti-police violence because I'm, uh, I would, I, my daughter just had a baby and it was a horrible birth and I'm mad because it couldn't be there, but I was a birth, you know, good birthing activist. So if you're living in the world, you don't have to look around because it'll just come right to you. And then you can know what to be active about and you, you, it can be your own thing. That, that is beautiful, Minnie Jean. It'll come to you. I feel that. Well, don't people agree? Doesn't I it come? I feel that. I felt that. Thank you so much, Minnie Jean, for sharing your experiences with the group. Um, really powerful life. And, and, I, and I hope in all of this that you're carrying so much of us with you at every step. Well, you better. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And I'm getting, I'm old now. I can't, you know, so I'm, I need the inspiration from the young people. Mm. I must, I live by that. Yes. Because I'm, yeah. what I, I, I almost forgot how old I am. <clears throat> 79, coming up 80. So, wow. Woohoo. Loving it. Never a dull moment. Let's keep it up. And that's what those, women who are being honored did. That's right. Until death. I love the conversation with Mrs. King when I was saying how much I admired her for her work. And she said, wait a minute. <laughs> we were watching your every move and we had, we we're so inspired by you. And, and we were, and of course, Dr. King did write a letter to Eisenhower. So, <clears throat> I'm glad we have the images of these young, beautiful kids. And we were the first black children to be on television, except for, I think, Sammy Davis Jr. Hmm. So to, um, so a whole, so many things transformed with that. Hmm. So that one paragraph that they give in American history books is part of the airy fairy mytho mythological American history that is foisted on our young people. Uh, but Minnie Jean, that inspiration that you share with us is you, you want our stories, and, but we want your lessons so that we can learn. And so even today, as we plan this, and I remember you saying this in the planning committee, we talked about how do we create multi-generational um, opportunities to step in and out of all these movements that we see building. And mm -hmm. so even as we go into the next part, our awards ceremony, the awards even that we are choosing and the folks that we're celebrating is because we want to model that multi-generational process. And right. so, Minnie Jean, your words are, are a stand for not only where we need to go next, but who we need to be next, right? And who we need to embody as we move uh, through through all of these movements, you know, that, that are coalescing right now, that have been both in the rivers, in the trees, in the oxygen that we breathe. And so, and so you know, I, I thank you. Uh, and I know we, I know this is not gonna be the first time we have, you know, these many conversations. Um, and I got to get down to Arkansas and hang out now with the folks in Arkansas. But I also want you to know that in, in transitioning to this next piece, that, that that inspiration that you speak to is a part of how we design uh, the awards and, and, and even the, the value system that drives the next part. So thank you, Minnie Jean, for, for this amazing rendition. Well, I, it's my pleasure. 
Absolutely, absolutely. And and I know folks where, you know, a couple of folks are texting me that they got to go back to work. So I'm going to also transition us to the award ceremony um, piece of this. And so the only thing we didn't get to ask Minnie Jean is how does Minnie Jean have fun? And so one of the things that, that we want to also do um, is celebrate uh, and, and keep joy and, and, and glory and grace uh, at the forefront because this work is not easy. Um, but we know that we also do it with grace. Um, and so I want to present our award ceremony this year um, the Coretta Scott King Center and the Celebrate Maya Project uh, united forces so that we could celebrate um, and have our award ceremony together. And our first award at the, I'll do the first awards for the Coretta Scott King Center. Um, our first award is actually to our student, our graduating student, Chris Chavers. Um, and uh, Chris is being recognized for the Coretta Scott King Justice Award. Uh, recognized on April 29th, 2021, um, during the Coretta Scott King Center celebration, co-hosted by the Maya Celebrate Maya Project, um, and for his tireless advocacy, public advocacy on behalf of issues of equity and social justice. Um, I wanted to take the time to tell you a little bit about Chris. Um, three cheers, five cheers, a hundred cheers. Uh, Chris is the type of student uh, that makes you say, wow. Um, so Chris, I'm not going to talk too much about you, but just a little, little, to give people a tidbit of who you are um, and how proud we are of you. So Chris started at Antioch in 2018. Chris is from Trotwood, Ohio, and is working, well, graduating uh, with a self-designed degree in pre-law and community engagement. Chris is the founder of the Black Student Union at Antioch College, where he organized food drives, advocated for Black community members, and volunteered at the Yellow Springs Senior Center. Chris served as the council co-president while helping to create the college council, always reviewing, revising, and approving administrative policy. This is the place where Chris advocated to have Juneteenth as a holiday at the college and not only organized the folks necessary for that, but also got it approved. Uh, Chris is, um, I mean, Chris is amazing. Chris uh, did co-ops at the Transgender Law Center in Oakland, California, has worked with the Communications and Development Department, and has worked at the law offices of alum Philip Brigham. Uh, he, Chris has been a Miller Fellow at the Village Impact Project in Yellow Springs and a student assistant at the Coretta Scott King Center. Chris is an organizer, a public advocate, and he started in middle school, y'all. Um, and most uh, warm to my heart um, is that Chris developed uh, peer uh, mediation and mentoring programs for high school students. Um, Chris is a member of the Board of Trustees of Antioch College and is constantly asking tough questions and challenging us to think deeper and look farther. My favorite is that Chris at every opportunity uses his access and position to amplify student and staff voice and to bring greater accountability. This is a skill set for all of us organizers that Chris has mastered. Chris has been an Antioch College board member since 2020. And today we celebrate Chris and tell him we know that you're graduating, but we know also that you will be forever connected to Antioch because we're not letting you go. And so Chris, with love, I share this award with you. We are honored by you and we hope that you are um, always in relationship with us at Antioch. And I hope that you can say some words, say some, share your heart with us. Wow, thank you uh, so, so much for those words. It, it means a lot to me. I wanted to start off with saying, you know, um, I want to honor my ancestors and my protectors because without them, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be able to speak. I wouldn't be able to do the things that I've been able to do. To me, this award is on behalf of being in community and working for the people. From a young age, Randy instilled in me that it takes a village to raise a child. And I grew up with many influences, but most of those influential influences are Black women. This world would not be standing without them. We would not be here without them. 
too many times they are not receiving this recognition that they deserve. So this award is for my four black grandmothers, two in which were my great grandmothers, that I had the blessing of being able to be taught a love that is unconditional and unwavering, a strength that is never broken and a courage that will withstand any storm. For my black mother who worked endlessly to provide and show me quitting was never an option. To my black mentors who are black women who've shown me the ropes, they've inspired me to persevere and led me in determination and efforts for black liberation for all. And to my young little sisters who are black who've kept me in check and held me when my chin was low and kept it high. This work derives from understanding that you, the individual, you are only the facilitator. You work as a vessel to help lead the actions and the needs for the community. And it's not just about the big wins and the big changes, but it's the small change that amounts to the bigger picture. My favorite quote, and I will forever always love this quote, is by Toni Morrison. And she says that I tell my students, when you get these jobs that you've been so brilliantly trained for, that you just remember that the real job is that you're free and you need to free somebody else. And if you have some power, that your job is to empower somebody else. This work is about exchanging to one another. And I am who I am today because of this exchange, because community empowered me, so I will continue to empower community. I will continue to exchange and engage in efforts to protect all Black people within every intersectionality that they withhold to our people at all costs and fight to dismantle the systems of white supremacy. These acts, this engagement, it is our duty, and I share it with you as you share it with me. And so it is an honor to be here today. It is an honor to be able to listen to the people before me. It was inspiring, the poetry, the speaker, and I, I, I thank you for this and for your time. Thank you, Chris. Collective clap all around. Thank you so much. The next award, and I propose Chris's words, is the Coretta Scott King Legacy Award. And this award is presented to Myla Cooper. Recognized on this day, April 29th, 2021, during the celebration and co-hosted with the Celebrate Maya Project for Myla's tireless advocacy on behalf of issues of equity and social justice at Antioch College and in the broader community. If anybody knows Myla, there is no one more deserving or more modeling of this award. And I would like to say some words about Myla, even though she tends to be more humble than often. She's a, and so I wanted to present to Myla Cooper for her unwavering support, nurturing, and leadership. Myla, there are many reasons why you were chosen. Your commitment to students, your relationship with local partners, your advocacy for Antioch and all of the spaces you occupy, your dedication to making equity stay at the forefront of our college agenda, and your resolve to bringing greater access and opportunity to students. In the last months of working with you, I have watched you model leadership development as you nurture and care for our most vulnerable students, and you do not give up on them, and they do not give up on you. Myla, you have worked on college campuses for the past 30 years. And while most recently you serve as Vice President for Student Affairs and Dean of Students at Antioch, you have also served as the Executive Director of the Coretta Scott King Center. You hosted the inaugural event that brought us the Coretta Scott King Legacy Luncheon in 2017 and made it a sold out event for 2018 and 2019. I know it would have been growing had COVID not hit. Myla also launched the inaugural Freedom to Vote Rally, the Antioch College Social Justice Symposium and the Civil Rights Pilgrimage, and our first ever boot camp for activism, an educational opportunity for students to engage in activism and social change. Myla served as a director of community outreach and service learning at Baldwin Wallace, as an adjunct faculty member at the Department of Religion, at, she taught the African American religious experience and also taught urban community engagement and the first year experience. 
and she has extensive experience in multicultural affairs and diversity education through several institutions, including Kenyon College, Xavier, and Penn State. At Kenyon, my, Myla served as Assistant Dean of Students and directed the Multicultural Affairs Office and the Snowden Multicultural Center. Myla earned her Bachelor of Science degree in Communication Studies and a Master of Arts degree in Higher Education Administration. Myla's also earning, she earned the Master of Divinity from Payne Theological Seminary, but this May 14th, she's also earning her doctorate in divinity. How Myla does all of this, I don't know y'all, but we need to give her a woo woo hands up because Myla um, exemplifies uh, the type of courage back to what we were talking about earlier and the type of tenacity you have to have uh, inside of these institutions. Myla's married to Pastor Gerald A. Cooper Esquire, and they are the grateful parents of two daughters, Antioch student Nia Patrice Cooper and 13-year-old Mariah Nicole Cooper, and the grandparents of Grace Patrice. So here it is to Dr. Myla Cooper, the Antioch TT, who takes care of all of us so that we can go out and have collective impact in the world. Ashe Myla. May your past always be a contribution to the building of a racially just and socially equitable society. And may we also have a great deal of fun in the process. I give you Myla Cooper. Thank you so much, Shadia. And thank you for um, taking the baton to lead this great institution we call the Coretta Scott King Center. Um, I am beyond excited for this event this afternoon, uh, which is a continuation, as Shadia has said, of the Legacy Luncheon we launched four years ago. It's great to see so many of you who are local throughout the Miami Valley region who attended and sponsored those luncheons held in downtown Dayton. It's also great to see some of the wonderful people I met in Little Rock as I was honored to travel there with Tom Manley and other colleagues to begin this partnership. So happy to see um, this come to fruition. To the McAdoo siblings, I salute you. You are the epitome of the phrase, young, gifted, and black. I look forward to hearing more from you on a national and global platform, and I'm inspired um, by your gifts. I am deeply grateful for this prestigious and special honor. In fact, it was um, it's an honor that I never expected to receive um, because I came to Antioch um, to direct the Coretta Scott King Center. And back then I would have never imagined that I would be um, in this position in student affairs, but it's a deep honor. Um, an honor that was first bestowed on our distinguished alumna, the Honorable Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton, followed by YWCA Dayton CEO and current Antioch board member Shannon Isom, activist Tamika Mallory, Black Lives Matter founder Opal Tometi, and civil rights activist uh, Dr. Bernard Lafayette. Indeed, I am in great company. I received this award um, not as one woman on an island. I received it on behalf of those who paved the way for our fight for social justice, equity, and freedom. Coretta Scott King, Maya Angelou, Sojourner Truth, Ida B. Wells, Fannie Blue, Hamer, Rosa Parks, Daisy Bates, Ella Baker, Dorothy Height, Diane Nash, Merle Evers, Mary McLeod Bethune, Shirley Chisholm, Angela Davis, Marian Mary Wright Edelman, Minnie Jean Brown Trickery, and if I can just make it a bit more contemporary, Stacey Abrams, that rock in Georgia, and Madam Vice President Kamala Harris, and there's so many, many more I could name. But even in the midst of this auspicious celebration, I pause to evoke the memory of those sisters whose lives were snuffed out too soon, and often we don't say her name. Michelle Cousseau, Sandra Bland, Tanisha Anderson, Brianna Taylor, we're still fighting for justice for her, and 16-year-old Makia Bryant. Those who were unnamed, those who were enslaved, and despite rape, separation from their children and other atrocities, still fought for freedom as this nation was built on their backs. 
Um, I pause to thank my own support circle, uh, my sister girlfriends, many of whom are in this Zoom room, my own family, including my grandmother, Chris, who lived well into her 90s, um, those who have mothered me, my sister. Sisters, um, my role model, my shero, one, my oldest sister, one who is with us today, um, Lynn Harris, my aunts, my own daughters, Antioch student Nia Cooper, our youngest Mariah Cooper, and our two-year-old granddaughter Grace. These are the reasons why I continue to fight for the younger generations. I also have to quickly thank those who um, did this work in the Coretta Scott King Center with me. As I said, I was not a one woman on an island, and I start with. Um, a president who actually made me stay at Antioch, um, Tom Manley, um, also Kevin Magruder, who chaired the search committee to hire me and walk with me um, every step of the way as we did this work together. Um, our first assistant director in the Coretta Scott King Center, Ashley um, Dubois, and then our um, second one, J.P. Robinson, who is still my writer, live partner at Antioch, and then board members who supported the work, um, Barbara Winslow, Malta, Bon Matheson and David Goodman and Maureen Lynch. And then the work, the, the folks that really made it joyful, those students who work with us directly in the Coretta Scott King Center, some of whom have already graduated, um, Melly Osanya, Marcel um, Varnasdale, Athena Peterson, Anna Samaki, Angel Nalabega, Kenzie Zalea, Ashley Matias Matos, Chris Chavers, Kade Brockington, and Jasmine um, Timister. Members of my family, thank you for being here. Members of my church, Wayman Miami Church in Dayton, and close friends who are with us during this celebration. My spouse, my boo, my partner in life, Gerald, my only brother is on the call too. Um, Jay, thank you so much for being here. I salute my sisters throughout this nation who are doing the work, displaying that black girl magic in every sector, every space, every situation where we find ourselves. What an awesome celebration, sister and so sisters in social justice. So my friends, let us continue to stand up, to speak up, especially truth to power, because the struggle indeed does continue. And we are the ones we've been waiting for. Ashe. Congratulations to Myla and to Chris. And it gives me so much pleasure to announce this next award to Minnie Jean Brown Tricky, who I'm so excited, so excited that you said yes to joining us today. Your speech was, as I knew it would be, spellbinding and makes us think, think, think. I'm only sad that we're not in the same place today, Minnie Jean, but believe me, I can feel your passion even through the screen. For as long as I've known you, I've been in awe of your passion, your unwavering sense of justice, equity, and dignity for each and every living human being. For me, you exemplify social justice each and every day. And because of that, the Celebrate Maya Project is so very proud to bestow on you, my friend and Shiro, the very first Celebrate Maya Project Social Justice Award for your lifetime of work to create a more just society and more equi equitable educational, economic, and cultural opportunities throughout our nation. There is so much more that I can say, but we want to save time. If you would like to make a response, I ask you to, but we are so proud to make this award to you. Thank you and congratulations. Um, this is a great honor for me. Thank you so much. Um, I'm so inspired when people collaborate, cooperate and coalesce and just do all these things of working together. This is the secret to social change is our working together. So thank you. Um, one of the things I do is um, honor my emotion, and this is very moving to me uh, because it's about friendship and love, and I can feel it, and I'm grateful to you for this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Minnie Jean. Thank you so much. 
as we come to our close soon, I wanted to take the time to just give you a few closing words. And then I would like to ask uh, Janice also if she'd like to say any closing words. First, I want to acknowledge uh, the folks that are here. Um, not only do we have we come from so many different walks of life, but there are also some amazing folks um, that, you know, if we were in person, I'd be going around hugging everybody <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and connecting people and saying, you got to talk to so-and-so, they would be a great connection for you, and you got to see this person. Um, but Zoom has allowed us at least to come together um, and and even despite uh, the COVID, uh, you know, we're moving through it. Um, and so I wanted to acknowledge folks uh, like Bamani Mayenda, who's here with us from Yellow Springs and, and, and the uh, greater Dayton area. Um, also the uh, winner of an award in the past here, the Legacy Project, but an amazing organizer. Um, I wanted to highlight Dr. Uh, Michael Washington from Northern Kentucky University and the students from Rockland High School and Staten Island High School who've been streaming in and out. Um, and so I wanted to, to, to basically share with you, we could go around and everybody could say all the amazing things. And I know, I'm hoping we can do something like that uh, maybe in a few months. But for right now, I just wanted to, to acknowledge us for staying together, for connecting, um, and for being with each other uh, through this uh, today. And the other, and the other, um, piece back to something that Tom said earlier is that the work that we're going to do in partnership is exactly what Minnie Jean invited us to. It's about connection, ultimately human connection. And so we hope that you carry that with you um, and we will be in touch. So we got y'all emails now. Uh, so we will be sending you uh, a list of some books. Um, we will be sending you some dates for some upcoming convenings. We will be inviting you to a global seminar we hope to do in the fall around some of the solutions to these high leverage uh, issues that we see around institutional racism. Uh, and, and we hope that you stay connected. So Janice, I pass the baton to you. Thank you, Shadia. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Tom, for this opportunity. Thank everyone who showed up today. I hope you've enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. One of my favorite Maya Angelou quotes is, if you're going down a road and don't like what's in front of you and look behind you and don't like what you see, get off the road create a new path. I think you said something like that, Minnie Jean. I think that's where we are today and what this conversation is about. As an organization, small that we are, the Celebrate Maya Project wants to be a part of creating this new path, creating a community, a nation, where social justice is the norm. So today we thank our new friends and our old friends for showing up to the, today and those who are already doing the important work like Minnie Jean. We look forward, Shadia, to continuing this relationship with Antioch College, who has long been on the forefront for social justice. And if I may leave with one other Maya Angelou quote, hope and fear cannot occupy the same space. Invite one to stay. Thank you all. Thank you, Janice. And so with Thank the affirmation of our First Nation and the blessings of our elders, may we walk with connection, committed to uplifting humanity and in relationship to our past, present, and our future. Thank you, Celebrate Maya. Thank you, all, to all new friends. Walk with spirit today. Thank you for being with us and Ashe. I'm the one who can make the difference, yes. I will make the difference against all odds. I will live.
to share my love with others, oh yes, I will make the difference. I can make it, take my hand as we make this journey across the land. the curve.